the Ukrainian AI community used to create, develop, and educate for a shining future. But then Russia ruined our peace. We switched to a new reality. We do our best to defend our country. The brightest AI minds came to share knowledge with us. Together, we will build a technological and secure future. Peace in Ukraine equals peace in the world. Support Ukraine. Support the AI community. Hi. So welcome today for your AI for Ukraine. This is the series of talks and workshops with international AI experts to support Ukraine, especially the tech community during this war. Uh, we are happy that you are joining us. Thank you for your support through your donation. It means a lot of us. So far, uh, we have collected around 300,000 Ukrainian hymnas to the biggest Ukrainian foundation, Come Back Alive. And we are continuing to collect funds. So during this live stream, you will have the opportunity to help us also. You will see the link down below the video where you can um, do your donation through all the time of this stream. Uh, one more important thing, um, don't ignore uh, air right sirens. So during the session, anytime you hear the siren, please go to the shelter. Uh, your security is the, the top priority for us. Don't, uh, uh, please, don't uh, be worried about the uh, session. It will be recorded and you will get it afterwards. So um, without further ado, uh, let me start. So a couple words about myself. I'm Oksana Kurelum. Uh, I did my master's in data science at the University of British Columbia in Canada. And now I work as an NLP engineer working with natural language processing so and but uh, keep this short mm, uh, without further ado uh, let me introduce today's topic it's a data-driven reinforcement learning with transformers with misha laskin so but before that to make it a bit more uh, interactive uh, we have um, a special tool for your uh, questions and i want you to test it out with me right now uh, please go to slider.com in your browser and put AI for Ukraine, or you can scan the QR code that you can see on the screen, or the, you're supposed to have the uh, link down below the video. Uh, so I will please uh, ask you uh, just to take a short poll with me, just so we can test it, how it works, and see the, the results and the, your answers. Um, so while you are doing all of it, uh, I will um, introduce, uh, give you a short intro of our today's speaker. We are so pleased to have him here today. We know that he is super busy right now, but he allocated some time to join us. So uh, please welcome Misha Laskin. Uh, Misha is a senior research scientist at, uh, at DeepMind. Uh, he works at the inter intersection of unsupervised and reinforcement learning. So he has a, a lot of experience in his life. He started, um, so he is like top uh, student from the University of Chicago in physics. He did his postdoctoral scholar uh, at UC Berkeley. Also, he's in the list 30 and this 30 for Forbes list. And he is a co-founder and CEO of AI company, Claire AI. I think there are lots, lots more about it. Uh, so I think uh, he can give more of it to you later. Uh, so please welcome Misha. Um, hi everyone, um, I'm Misha. Thank you for yeah, thank you for that nice introduction. Um, it's yeah, I was, I was curious to see um, how familiar people are with reinforcement learning, and it looks like uh, in this audience quite familiar. Um, oh, not not entirely, but that's okay <laughs> because this uh, the talk is. Um, meant to be um, pretty inclusive. So even if you don't know much about it, um, I think that this talk will be quite accessible. Um, so uh, should I get started? Yes, one more thing uh, for me, uh, please, during the session, uh, uh, your, uh, you, if you have any questions, 
uh, please like write them down uh, at our uh, at these two that you have. We will definitely read it at the end of the talk and I'll upload the most interesting questions will be answered first. Again, uh, please donate um, meanwhile and uh, pay attention to air raid sirens. So um, I'm giving back the stage to Misha. Uh, thank you, Misha. Uh, yeah, of course, and thank you. I'm, I'm really excited to be here, very excited to share. Um, I guess this is going to be both a mix of a tutorial um, and some new work on reinforcement learning with transformers. Uh, yeah, but I'm, I'm happy to be here and uh, uh, grateful that I can support this cause. So yeah, let's let's get started. Um, as Oksana mentioned, I'm a research scientist at uh, DeepMind, and uh, particularly we've, um, recently we've been looking a lot at how we can develop generalist agents with reinforcement learning. Uh, so the overview of the talk is um, we're going to start with just a quick, uh, almost a quick history uh, of uh, deep learning from 2012 to 2022, um, covering computer vision, natural language processing, and deep RL to situate where these fields are today and how they differ. Um, we'll talk about these um, pretty incredible properties that have emerged recently um, in terms of in-context learning with transformers. Um, we're seeing some very incredible agents coming out like uh, the GPT agents, um, Flamingo, um, Gato like agents. And then uh, we'll talk about in-context reinforcement learning, which might be a new phrase that, I, that you may not be that, that familiar with yet, but that's kind of what the new work is about. And I'll explain why, what it means, uh, why it's important and cover this uh, new work on um, algorithm distillation. So to um, give a sense of our starting point, um, if we look at where AI was in the early 2010s, there was this breakthrough um, ImageNet moment in 2012, where a model called AlexNet learned to classify uh, a bunch of images um, with deep neural networks. And what was interesting about that point in time from 2010 to 2015 is that this field of deep learning emerged and it started bringing different machine learning fields together that all basically operated under the same paradigm. So in computer vision, um, the kind of found breakthrough uh, deep learning model was AlexNet. Its input was images, it output classes, classified those images. The architecture was a conv convolutional neural network and the loss this was optimized with was a cross entropy loss for um, how well can you predict these classes. Then something very similar was happening in natural language processing. Um, there's a model called seek to seek Its input was um, Eng the English language. Its output was French, so it was a translation model. Its network was a recurrent neural network, um, so also a neural network, just a slightly different one. Loss, basically same loss as the ImageNet one, a cross-entropy loss that matches how well did you predict uh, the characters on the, um, on the French side, given the English input. And remarkably, the same thing also happened in reinforcement learning with the DeepQ network. The input there was images from Atari games. The output was actions, um, how should the agent act? And the network was basically the same thing as AlexNet. It was a convolutional neural network. Um, and it had a, a different loss called a Bellman loss. But what I'm trying to show here is that deep learning kind of standardized these, what used to be completely different problems into one, one format, really, that just had a model, input, output, the network architecture and the loss that you're optimizing. And so then we can look at how have these fields progressed since. So if we look at NLP, it really started off with narrow single task agents. So the seek to seek model could only translate English to French. It couldn't really do anything else. And since then, we've moved on to these generalist multitask agents. So models like GPT, Chinchilla and so forth can generate text, they can generate code, they can translate languages, they can do question and answer, they can follow instructions. And this is one model, it's not, these are different models. Each of these models can do many things. And that's pretty incredible. Similarly, when we look at vision, something, something very similar happened. So um, initially, AlexNet or GANs, they can classify ImageNet or GAN can generate pretty low quality images. Um, but we've moved on since to generalist multitask agents like Dolly, Flamingo, and Stable Diffusion, which can 
describe images with language. They can automatically caption these images, even videos. They can do question and answering about images. They can generate very high quality images from text across all sorts of different categories. And so there's this movement from narrow single task agents to generalist ones that have really enabled pretty incredible results in, in both natural language and um, computer vision. So when we situate this with reinforcement learning, um, similarly reinforcement learning started off with narrow single task agents like DQN and PPO that could solve some simple tasks like Atari or Majoko, but they are narrow. You need one agent for each task. So each Atari game has one reinforcement learning, um, a unique set of parameters for a reinforcement learning algorithm. And when we look at where we are today, we have very powerful, but still narrow single task agents. So you can see a clear divergence when there are um, algorithms like AlphaGo, AlphaStar, MuZero that are quite amazing in what they can accomplish. They can play Go at a superhuman level. They can play um, StarCraft as, at a superhuman level and do all sorts of incredible things. But these agents are still quite narrow. They can only master specific, very, very hard tasks. So like the Go agent, AlphaGo can play Go, which is one of the hardest games in the world, but it can't play tic-tac-toe. And that's and, and, and that's kind of you know a shame. Um, we want to have generalist agents. And this is where I'd say the field of reinforcement learning has probably diverged most from natural language and computer vision. That is to say that there it's not that there has been progress. There've been a lot of progress in reinforcement learning. So this is a series of papers that basically go from 2013 with the breakthrough DQN paper to Mu0 and Muesli, which are current state-of-the-art reinforcement learning algorithms. And these are scores on Atari, and they're normalized with respect to humans. So DQN in 2015 um, got a 79% uh, human score. So it was 80% as good as a human. Whereas now these reinforcement learning algorithms are 10 times better than human players. They're just completely superhuman, which is incredible, but they're narrow. So again, one reinforcement learning algorithm for each Atari game. On the other hand, when you look at language models, um, they're basically now generalist multitask agents. This is a screenshot of, uh, if you go to OpenAI's um, API playground, you'll see all these different tasks that the language model can do. And what's remarkable is that this is a single language model that based on how you prompt it, can do all sorts of things, question answering, SQL translation, classification, um, explaining code, it's summarization, it's quite incredible the range of capabilities that it has. And the key thing that has enabled this is uh, what's called in-context learning. So that's an important term to um, remember and understand for this talk, uh, and I'll explain it right here. So what's incredible about large language models and vision language models, VLMs, is that you can tell them what to do in natural language. So in blue here, this is um, kind of a context or a prompt. And you can just tell, you, you can tell a language model, you know, translate English to French. And so you have these, you, you provided these examples of like sea otter to the French translation, peppermint to the French translation and so forth. And then when you give it cheese as an example, um, the model automatically completes it for you with fromage, um, if it's a good model. And what's remarkable is that you can, change the prompt to do anything you want. So you can say, summarize this piece of text and then let it complete it, or um, you know, complete this piece of code and let it do it and it'll write code for you. Um, and this is called in-context learning because the model here doesn't update its weights anymore. The weights are frozen. You're just telling it what to do and it looks at the context. You're filling its context with instructions. It looks at its context and makes a decision on what it needs to do. And so this is in context learning and it's really what's powering all these advances. What's cool about in context learning is that it can be done in any modality. So it, you don't have to put language in the context, you can put images in the context. So there's this language model or vision language model from DeepMind called Flamingo. And this model in context learns from text and images. So there's this chat interface that they showed where you can, for example, put this image of um, this kind of soup monster made of wool, and you can ask it, what is this picture? That's so in blue is what the human is asking, and in uh, gray is what the model is saying. The model says, it's a bowl of soup with a monster, uh, his face on it. And the human asks, what is the monster made out of? 
And the, trans the model looks at its context and says, it's made of vegetables. In this case, it's not entirely correct. So the human says, no, it's made out of kind of fabric. Can you see what kind? And it says, oh, it's made out of wool fabric. So this is pretty incredible. Um, you can put whatever you want, text, images, other signals into the context. And we have powerful models that will be able to um, complete your instruction. And that's why they're general, because you, it's really because of the in-context learning. You can put anything in the context and it'll be able to, to do that if it's been trained well. So um, this is where we move on to transformers, because when we think like, what changed? Why couldn't we do this before? Um, well, the thing that's enabled large language models and vision language models to learn in context is very large, diverse data sets from the internet um, and transformers. Specifically, the sentence that to kind of remember is that large language models are trained with self-supervised prediction. So you have large data sets on the internet like Wikipedia and they, they don't have labels. They don't have, you know, this sentence, you know, corresponds to, you know, a sentence about, you know, something happy or something sad. They just have text. So self-supervised prediction means that you just make predictions about the data without any extra kind of labels from humans. So for text, you can predict, given the current set of characters, what the next character is going to be. So these objectives are trained on very large internet scale data sets, which is very, very important um, with the right architecture, the transformer architecture. Um, so while I actually think the data sets component is probably, it's as important as the architecture, if not more, and um, doesn't get as much attention. Um, and, but in this talk, we won't talk so much about the data just yet. Um, we'll talk about the transformer architecture. Um, but these data sets, you can look them up. They're web text, common crawl, the pile. These are very large um, data sets that are kind of an agglomeration of um, internet knowledge, such as Wikipedia, Reddit, and other data sets. So the transform architecture looks like this. And we'll go through kind of the important parts of the structure. So I'll explain what's happening here. Um, at the bottom here, these are inputs. And the inputs can be a sentence. So um, I think the classic sentence they use in NLP is the brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. So you can imagine that sentence going in and it has an input. So this is the input embedding. It gets kind of transformed with a small neural network or just a linear layer um, or another form of tokenization um, into a kind of more abstract space. Then you add these positional encodings to them, which kind of tell you the ordering of the characters so that you, you kind of know what order things came in. And then this goes into this process called multi-head attention, which I'll explain in the next slide. And that's really where all the work is happening. Um, there's some normalization that's happening afterwards. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and residual addition. And then you pass through a feed forward network, which is just a normal um, MLP. Um, but multi-head attention is really where all the work is happening. So what's multi-head attention? Um, this diagram might look scary, but it's not, I promise. Um, because again, um, there are you know, less important and more important pieces. The purple box is the most important thing here. Um, and recall like this example input that we have, the brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. This is an input. It gets translated to these uh, objects called values, keys, and queries. These are V, K, and Q. So you transform them with a, the sentence with a linear network to values, keys, and queries. These three things are passed into this purple box, which is um, dot product attention or just attention. The output is then you, you do this many times across H, you know, of these attention blocks. So this is why it's called multi-head. But it's really this the operation on each head that matters. Um, you kind of merge all those outputs together, and then you you know put it through another layer and and this is the main kind of multi-head attention block. Um, so going back here, this is like this block fits into this orange box and you stack N of these overall blocks together and that's the transformer architecture or at least a GPT like decoder only the, um, transformer architecture. Um, so yeah, let's look at what is happening in this purple box here. 
Um, again, it might look complex, uh, but it's, uh, but, it's but I promise it's, uh, I'll try to make it simple. Let's think about this input again. The brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. What are these three objects that we mentioned earlier, queries, keys, and values doing? So recall that these are, you, you took, um, let's say the sentence has T words in it. So this like capital T. You took this thing and you projected it into um, a hidden space that has dimension D. It's a vector. So now you have T vectors of dimension D. And what the values thing is doing is that it's basically telling you to see all the words in the sentence. So you've kind of taken the T words, you project them to D. It's an object that kind of sees all the words. And what attention is doing is it telling you for each word, how much should I attend to it? How much mass should I assign to it um, in order to kind of rank its importance relative to other words? And this is where these queries and keys come in. So when you take the query times kind of the transpose of the key, so remember this is a T by D matrix. So when you do the transpose, you get D by T. And when you multiply those together, you get T by T. And what this is doing is it allows you to see the relationships between all the words. So for example, um, this output of this weights after the softmax is gonna be some number between zero and one for each word pair. So brown and fox, brown and jump, brown and all the other words and like this for all the words. So brown and fox is probably gonna have high attention because brown, um, brown tail, it relates to the fox. But fox and jump, will also have high attention, but maybe the and fox won't have high attention because it's not a really important um, word to understand what's happening. Similarly, lazy and dog will have high attention, but lazy and fox will have low attention because lazy isn't referring to the fox, it's referring to the dog. And of course, it's not just gonna work like that out of the box, it depends on what objective you're optimizing but if you're optimizing the self-supervised next word prediction, like I take the brown and then you predict fox, and I take the brown fox and you predict jumped. Um, when you do this sort of prediction, these kind of attention patterns emerge where the network learns to pay attention to the things that are most important for predicting the next word. So this is how attention works. And this is really kind of the important driving factor that enables transformers to work. Um, it's, it's really kind of the main conceptual innovation. So with that, uh, let's see, I'm just going to take a look. Um, I guess it looks like there are no, no questions so far, so maybe we'll save them to the end. Um, but we'll move on to reinforcement learning because the, the talk is about the relationship between transformers and reinforcement learning. So I kind of just explained transformers, so we'll move on to our own. Um, a quick primer on reinforcement learning. It's, it's actually like wonderfully like simple what reinforcement learning tries to accomplish. All you're trying to do is you have to, you want, your the goal is to maximize um, the reward over an agent's lifetime. So you obviously need to define what that reward is. It could be points in a video game. It could be um, something, you know, um, I mean, it can be any, any metric really. So, uh, you know, for a company, it could be like maximizing revenue or profit, like under the constraint that, you know, your users are, you're not, you know, you're not harming your users. Um, it could be, anything that can quant be quantified as a metric that you want to maximize over the lifetime of some existing agent. And so the agent just wants to maximize the sum of rewards. So in video games, like the point system really makes sense. You're just trying to get the most points that a video game will allow you to. Um, or in robotics, it might be you're trying to, you know, um, do some task like um, maybe, maybe you're in a car factory and you're trying to build the car door. And so you get a reward if it's built correctly and not if you if, if it's not and the reinforcement learning model works in the following way where you have an agent it acts in the environment once it acts in the environment it receives the reward and the next state so it has the current state where it's at now it acts in the environment that changes the state the state being kind of image observation so you can think of an autonomous vehicle it's driving the action might be turn right and so the images that the autonomous vehicle sees are different now so that's the next state and the reward, whether it turned right correctly or not. And this loop just keeps going and the agent um, maximizes reward on its own. Um, the main object that's important in reinforcement learning that's used um, across basically all reinforcement learning algorithms 
uh, are these objects called value function. Um, here specifically, I'm showing an action value function. Um, these are often referred to as Q functions. But these objects basically say, given my current state, the current image I'm seeing, or any other state, and the action I think I'm going to take, say I'll take you know, some action, what do I think the sum of my rewards over my lifetime after that is going to be? So it's kind of, if I take a bad action, I'll think that my sum of rewards is going to be low. If I take a good action, I think, oh, odds are is that it's going to be something pretty high. And this value function is usually a neural network. So usually you have a neural network that tries to estimate this for you. Um, and that's kind of the main object that, uh, that people study in reinforcement learning. So in reinforcement learning, you're usually, you're, you don't have, um, your, your agent has an estimate of what returns it's going to get through these value functions. Agent is saying, you know, again, given this current observation, if I take some action, um, I think I'm going to do well or I'm not going to do well. And it tries to take actions that lead it to the, I think I'm going to do well uh, trajectories. And so if we take transformers, like this architecture I just described, and just insert it to reinforcement learning, is that the answer? Like, does that work? And the answer is that um, it can, but transformers uh, in used in RL for Q learning can be quite unstable. So this is a paper on stabilizing transformers for RL. The yellow here is a normal transformer. You can see it completely fails. And then orange is a modified transformer, and it does really well. I guess the, the main takeaway here is that there's, you know, one transformer completely fails, another one does well. Um, usually when you see things like that, it uh, means that the architecture is pretty unstable for what you're trying to do. Um, but even if they work, the issue is that these are still doing single tasks. So Q functions, um, like this one that's shown here, are usually, you can have multitask Q functions, but usually they're studied in the single task setting. So for this single task, um, will I be able to maximize my returns? And that doesn't really generalize to new tasks. So we want to move RL from this powerful narrow task agents to generalist agents. Um, and I actually think it's okay if we take a hit in how powerful they are, um, because hopefully if we get kind of a generalist agent that can kind of broadly do things like a human can, we can then further evolve it to be as powerful as current narrow systems. Um, but I think it's important to kind of move from these narrow RL systems to general RL systems and understand why that's hard and how do we get there. One solution that's been interesting over the last few years, it's uh, picked up some um, steam among the community is uh, what's called offline reinforcement learning. So recall that in reinforcement learning, we said that the agent interacts with the environment many times and maximizes its reward that way. What offline reinforcement learning does is you have some data set of interaction. So suppose Tesla collects a big data set of humans driving the autonomous, or the, the autonomous vehicles or other interactions. So you have that big data set. And the question is, how can I learn a decision-making policy from that data set? So it's kind of a different paradigm for doing reinforcement learning, where instead of the agent interacting with the world, with the world and crafting its value function and getting better over time, the agent just looks at a big data set that it has of all these interactions and tries to get a decision-making um, policy out of it. And if we do this, then we maybe can make reinforcement learning look similar to NLP and vision, because that's how NLP and vision work. We have a big data set, you try to fit a neural network to it and get a policy out, which in this case predicts in, in, in NLP, it predicts next characters. So it tries to predict language for you. So we're going to shift gears then to this kind of um, to the specific papers that we'll be talking about, um, and a number of recent works have investigated how to convert um, this offline reinforcement learning setting, because it looks so similar to NLP and Vision. How to just make not just the data look similar, but how to make the prediction objectives similar. So instead of doing these Q functions that I previously talked about, how can you make these problems look like NLP where you're just doing next character prediction. 
And this is one of the kind of um, first papers to propose this kind of concept that you can take a reinforcement learning data set, model it with a transformer sequentially, and get useful decision-making capabilities out. This paper is called Decision Transformer. And the decision transformer architecture, <coughs> excuse me, um, the decision transformer architecture um, treats reinforcement learning as a sequential prediction problem. There are no value functions learned here. So you have this big offline data of, say, Atari play or you know, some other kind of data. And your transformer, instead of modeling next characters, so instead of modeling to take you know, that sentence, the brown fox jumped over the lazy dog, and so it takes the brown and it needs to predict fox, takes the brown fox, needs to predict jump. Here it takes the return, which is the sum of rewards at a given state, tries to predict and, and the next state, and tries to predict the next the action that the agent took. And in this way, your actions replace like your um, characters in NLP. And your conditioning, what you're putting in the context is returns, states, and actions. And you're trying to predict the next actions. So this structure looks exactly the same as sequence prediction in natural language processing. It kind of converts RL into a language modeling problem. And what's really interesting about this line of work is that by doing this, by doing something that's quite simple, uh, because you're not learning any Q functions, any value functions, you're just doing next character uh, prediction where your characters are actions. And by conditioning, so these big R's here are returns. So you're conditioning, like it's saying that you can tell the agent, oh, I want a return that is really high. Give me the actions that give me high return. Um, or you can say, I want my return to be low, which usually you wouldn't want to say, but that's what this model would be able to do. It can output um, policies that satisfy different returns. So by asking it to output returns that are high, these decision transformers can outperform <laughs> um, reinforcement learning methods and, um, and um, imitation learning methods as well. Um, and I guess when I, I say outperform reinforcement learning methods, they can kind of match them or outperform them, um, where TD learning is basically offline reinforcement learning with Q functions. So what this paper showed that was quite interesting is that you can convert reinforcement learning into a sequence prediction problem. And we didn't know that was possible before. Well, what are the limitations? Um, there are two um, main ones. Uh, the first one is that this is still in a single task setting. So you have one transformer per task. And the second is that uh, the transformer can't really improve itself. So what you see is what you get. You ask the transformer, you know, give me this reward, you know, give me this performance. And then the policy does something. And if it doesn't do that, then there's no way for it to improve itself. So it doesn't have this self-improvement mechanism. Um, and what these plots show is on the x-axis, you have the return that you want your transformer to get. And on the y-axis, the actual performance. And you can see that initially for, you know, some lower target returns, um, it matches the green line, which is kind of if it got the perfect return, what that would look like. But that basically starts to degrade after a while. So this means that you can say, you know, I want a really high return in this environment. I want 100% you know, human score. And the transformer outputs a, a policy that gives you 70% human score. And that's OK, but it has no way of improving itself to get back to 100%. It's kind of what you see is what you get. and that's that's a limitation. Um, mind you, this is the same limit. This is limitation also exists for language models and vision language models. This is just a limitation of doing sequential modeling without the transformer on its own being able to learn. So this is a general limitation. So moving on to multi-game decision transformer. Um, here the transformer, um, you take a decision transformer and improves on this by making it multitask. So it solves one of the limitations. Recall we had one limitation is that these agents are narrow still and the other is that they can't improve themselves. 
what multi-game decision transformer does is it addresses the um, narrowness part and gets you a general transformer that can one transformer that can play many Atari games. So this is what the environment setting looks like. Um, you have your pre-training um, on non-expert and expert trajectories across a lot of different Atari games. You pass this to the multi-game decision transformer, and after that, it can play um, it can play um, Atari games and fine-tune to new ones. So uh, this is to say that the architecture enables you to have a kind of generalist agent, at least in Atari, with some, with some limitations that I'll discuss later. The thing to note about the decision transformer architecture is that it's basically the same as the decision transformer with small modifications, which is cool. Uh, that is to say, there's nothing that prevented the decision transformer from being multitask. That's just kind of what the initial authors um, did in that first paper. So now if you just take that big Atari data set of all these interactions on different games, you tokenize the observations into patches. That's something that's quite common in um, vision language models. And you have this return and action and reward prediction, uh, similar to decision transformers, where there's a, sm a small detail that this model actually automatically learns to model returns and kind of rather than a human having to say, maximize, you know, do this return, um, this model will automatically figure that out for you. But I think that that's kind of a detail. Um, the important thing is that it's the same architecture as a decision transformer, basically. And this gets you a transformer that can play many different games. Um, so the gray bars here show the human normalized score that you can get for narrow agents, like a DQN um, playing games. And the highest blue bar is the multi-game decision transformer showing you how you can get um, this MGDT one transformer to play all of these Atari games roughly as well as, um, I mean, roughly as well as uh, these narrow agents. Um, now, of course, if you recall seeing like the um, chart earlier that of how far reinforced learning has gotten for narrow agents, um, the best narrow agents achieve like a thousand percent human normalized score. So this is still much, much lower than the best agents we have today, but it's showing that we're moving from narrow to generalist agents. And that's what's interesting about it, that now we have one transformer that can play all these games. So the last paper I'll cover before covering before going into some of the newer work is um, this Gato paper, um, which is um, Gato is I mean it means cat in Spanish. It stands for a generalist agent, and this is a scaled up example of something like the multi game decision transformer. Um, I actually think Gato came out a little earlier than, than multi game decision transformer. So the environment setting for Gato is that you have many, many environments, many different environments. You have video games, you have robots. This agent can do not only games and, and robots and these sorts of tasks, it can also caption images. It can complete text. It's kind of like a language model, vision language model, and a reinforcement learning agent all fuse into a single transformer, which, is, which I think is kind of the main takeaway and what's so interesting about this work. And the architecture, this kind of goes back to me saying that you can put any, any information in the context. So the Gato architecture basically can accept any modality and from that modality, it predicts actions as output. So you can give it Atari images, you can give it text, you can give it robotics images, you can give it robotics sensor input, you can give it images for Q and A um, and it will just you know infer what it is that you want to do from that and output actions, which can be robotic actions, video game actions, it can be outputting text. Um, I think it's kind of showing a nice vision of the kinds of agents that we will see more and more of, like big generalist agents that can kind of do everything. The tasks are specified just like you would for language, large language models. Um, you specify them via prompt. So that's kind of what I was saying. You can basically put in an example of like 
the Atari game that you wanted to play, and it will continue doing that. Or the image, like, you know, if you want to translate uh, a, you know, English to French, um, then you can put in that context that I showed before, and it will do that as well. Um, but importantly is that this, I think, shows, um, kind of implies an additional limitation that the previous methods had as well, is that you have to specify these prompts manually. This agent, if you don't do that, won't know what to do and will not have a way of improving itself just by interacting with the environment. So we'll get to that, but this is kind of how you tell Gato what you want to do, you prompt it. And the main results um, are as follows. Um, basically, what, what you can do here is uh, you can get this one big transformer to do all these tasks. I'm not going to go through like what all these tasks are, just um, clearly it's a lot. And on the y-axis, you have the uh, number of tasks above a threshold, which is kind of the you know human score. And you can kind of see that for, you know, until you get up to, you know, maybe 50% or 60% human score, like there are a lot of tasks above that threshold and then that starts to decrease. So for 100% human score, um, there aren't that many tasks left anymore that this agent can do. So it's showing a limitation. It's showing that this agent can do a lot of things, but it can't do them well. Um, but that's, I think, where we want to be. It's kind of what I was saying earlier that previously we had narrow agents that can do something specifically really, really well, like play the game of Go. And now we're moving towards generalist agents that can do a lot of things okay. That's a good starting point because we have the architecture for the agent to do a lot of things. And now we just need to figure out how can we improve? How can the agent improve itself? How can we get it to kind of learn constantly instead of just kind of knowing a bunch of tasks um, without improving? And that's kind of the other limitation is that, that I mentioned earlier, if you prompt these agents and they don't do what you want them to do, there's nothing, there's nothing you can really do. You kind of have to hope that they'll do what your prompt said, but if they don't, you have there's no recourse, um, which affects their reliability. Um, another cool thing about Gato is that you know this, what I was saying earlier is that it can also caption images and have dialogue, um, so it's really a generalist agent, which is quite cool. Okay, so um, with this, I'll switch gears to some of this new work, which I hope you can kind of see where this is going. Um, it's going towards how can we get these generalist agents that can improve themselves. So we've seen that large language models, which is just a word I'll use for all of these models I presented, um, can learn in context. You can give them a prompt and they'll try to figure out what you, what you want them to do. And the big innovation here has been big data sets, very large data sets, um, self-supervised learning and transformers. Um, the reason I say mask is because you're masking them so that you kind of do this next character prediction. But what transformers can't do, which we've kind of seen a number of times now, is that they can't reinforcement learn in context. That is to say, if they don't do what you wanted them to, there's no way for them to interact with the environment and, and get better. They don't have an autonomous improvement mechanism, um, which is extremely limiting. But that's that's really kind of a fundamental tenet of AI systems is that they should be self-improving. So if your AI system is not self-improving, it's a big problem and something's really wrong. So the way people take these models and adapt them to downstream tasks, like suppose you want them to um, you know, write code for you or do all these things that we mentioned previously, but you want them to do it reliably. Um, well, how are you going to do this? You can prompt them manually, which is what we've been discussing. And you can prompt hack. You can kind of try a bunch of different prompts. And there are a number of papers saying that, oh, if you add, you know, let's think step by step into the transformer prompt, then it will do much better. Um, so there's clearly, you know, the information that you put in the prompt matters a lot, but that still doesn't really address the psych self-improvement mechanism that we're looking for. You can fine tune them which is what multi-game decision transformer does and um, 
RL with human preferences does. So you can take the transformers and fine tune their weights. But then you've kind of directed them to solve the specific task that you wanted them to, or kind of in a specific way that you wanted them to. And so you're kind of losing this generality when you do that. So that means for all these different tasks, you'll need to fine tune them differently. And that's also not really desirable. Or you might retrain with a larger model and more data, but you can kind of see that none of these points really address how to make a transformer improve itself um, autonomously, just improve itself without you having to go in and intervene in any way. And you know, you might have thought that, oh, maybe decision transformers in Gato, what we described before, like they can do this. But this is a crucial distinction is that these previous methods, they learn policies, but they do not learn RL algorithms. That is to say, policies can't improve themselves autonomously through trial and error. And that's what we want. We want transformers that improve themselves through trial and error. Uh, so I'll be describing in the remaining, um, you know, uh, maybe next yeah, five, 10 minutes of the talk, um, a new paper that uh, we actually just released today. So this is on archive now, you can check it out. It's called In Context Reinforcement Learning with Algorithm Distillation. Um, if you want kind of a high level uh, summary of it, which is basically going to be, I mean, uh, similar to the next few slides, um, you can, uh, you know, find me on Twitter at Misha Laskin and, um, yeah, and kind of see some information I put up there. But the main question that we're asking is, can we get re transformers to not just learn in context, but reinforce and learn in context? And the answer, I mean, so the, the, to be, you know, the punchline is that, yes, we can do this. And the recipe is remarkably simple, which I think is the other cool thing. So previously we saw if we're doing this sequential modeling with transformers, we you know, take offline data, we model the sequences. And what this paper shows is that if your data is set up the right way, you can take the same exact models as Gato and decision transformer and multi-game decision transformer, not really change anything and even simplify them. You can make, you can get a simpler transformer model that will be able to improve itself. And the key is that your data should be the histories of a, of a reinforcement learning algorithm. So um, recall transformers are good at imitating their data. So if your data is composed of reinforcement learning agents that are trying to achieve stuff, then your transformer might be able to, by imitating them, learn to do trial and error learning as well. And this data is composed of <coughs> narrow RL agents. So you have an RL agent that does task one, task two, task three, one does task 10, but you have the full histories of learning. So these are narrow single task RL agents, which we've been describing already. And we've like we've seen that they've gone quite good. And so the question is, how do we take these narrow agents and build generalist RL agents out of them? And so this is kind of you know one potential answer. So you've collected a data set of say, an RL algorithm doing all sorts of tasks. So playing Go, playing chess, doing Atari, doing all the possible games, doing robotics, you have a big data set that is the learning history. So the algorithm starting from doing nothing to getting really, really good. And you can see where this is going. Like if you can predict this process of starting from nothing and getting really, really good, then maybe your transformer will also be able to start from nothing and get really good on its own. So the prediction problem is very similar to what we've seen. It's even simpler because pre before we were modeling returns, which is a sum of rewards, and now we're not even doing that. We're just modeling rewards. So you have observations, action, reward, observation, action, reward. You have this full history. And throughout this history, as I was saying, it start, the agent starts off bad and comes out and, and you know ends up becoming expert. And all you're doing is that you're predicting the actions in this data. So you're not doing any value learning. You're not doing anything like that, you're doing exactly what transformers do for natural language processing. You're just predicting the next action, given the full history that preceded this thing. And in context RL emerges with this method that we're calling algorithm distillation. So the way you value it, you take this transformer that you've pre-trained, you drop it into an environment, its weights are fixed. So it's you're not changing its weights. Its context is empty and it will, interact with the environment, see an observation, 
okay, predict the next action, interact again, see the next observation and the next one and fill its context on its own. So this is kind of the learning history in this environment water maze, but this trans the, the main takeaway here is that the transformer wasn't prompted or conditioned on anything. It's doing this all on its own. And this red curve is our method algorithm distillation. And you can see that it's, it's doing reinforcement learning. It's starting off from being a very weak agent and it's becoming really good over time. Um, and the baselines, I, I think, you know, in the interest of time, I won't cover them too much. Um, but basically the green one is the previous, you know, Gato-like agents, which you can see like do not are not able to explore and so are not able to solve to, to do reinforcement learning in context. Um, and, and this works on a number of different environments. You see the same pattern, red curve much higher than the other things. Um, the blue curve, if you're wondering, is the source algorithm that this thing was trained to distill, which you, you might think that they, I mean, we were expecting for them to be similar red curve and blue curve because you're just imitating the source algorithm. But it turns out that distilling it into an in-context transformer um, gets you a much more data efficient algorithm, which is, which is actually a really neat property that I'll discuss in a moment. In context RL, importantly, only emerges if your context is long. So basically, if there's a lot of, a lot of improvement happening in the learning data over that context, then your transformer will be able to extract that improvement. So your policy changes throughout your, your training data. At first, it's a bad policy. It's random. Then it's medium. And finally, it's you know expert. And so for the transformer, it needs to kind of predict where does it think it's along its learning history? And it needs to use that context to, to predict the next action. So if the context is long enough, it will be able to pick out an improvement operator, which is a really neat property. Um, another cool thing um, is that this transformer with algorithm distillation, if you prompt it with suboptimal data, so suppose you prompt it with a robot that is doing things 5% optimally, 25% optimally, 50% and so forth, that's what you have on the left-hand side. And you can see that it will start at that point where the policy was, and it will improve it until it's optimal or near optimal, which is, you know, it kind of means you can put whatever data you want in this transformer and it'll just kind of automatically improve it without you having to do anything. Whereas if you look at expert distillation, which is again, closer to Gato decision transformer, when you give it this suboptimal policy, it just maintains its suboptimality. It kind of stays at the same level where the policy was. And finally, this is, I think, not well understood, but an interesting property that on green, you have the learning curve for the source algorithm <coughs> that the transformer was trained on. So this is the data that the transformer was trained on. It learned this quickly. The transformer learns way faster, which is kind of, yeah, um, kind of unusual. Like it's quite surprising. And to note the different, another big difference between the red and green curves is that the red curve is one transformer that can solve many tasks. This is evaluated over you know, thousands of tasks. And the green curve is for each task, there's a specific RL algorithm that was tuned to just do that task. So the transformer is not only more general because it can do, it's one transformer, it can do any task versus one algorithm per task, but it's learning more efficiently. Um, so that's kind of the end of my talk. Um, I think that yeah, we, we talk about data-driven RL with transformers. Um, and this is all kind of a lead up to show, you know, this one of the main limitations right now is um, that they can't really reinforce and learn in context. They can't really do learning through trial and error. And now they can. Um, I'd say the main limitation of this work that I just presented is that it's still um, at fairly small scale. So it's not at like an interesting enough scale for us to be like, oh, wow, you know, yeah, I solved. So, there's a lot of work to do to scale these things up, but I think it's a really interesting ingredient that was discovered um, that can lead us to more generalist decision-making systems. Uh, so yeah, thank you. I, thank you, Misha. Like, uh, we can't thank you enough because it's like, uh, as you said, the first time you're presenting, your paper is published only today, and we are the first one that can hear uh, this uh, from the author was a great explanation going into details, even the history behind it before, like all the, what preceded before. So again, we are much, much appreciate. 
that you join us, that you uh, presented it to us. Um, also, uh, like uh, the question I have from me, like, do uh, after uh, you published it, uh, is a is there any chance there is something like papers with code that you can play around on, I don't know, Google Collab that you can something get the uh, just hands on it? Yeah, it's a, um, so we're planning to release a Collab um, that allows people to play with it. The nice thing is that it's, it's actually really simple. So it's, um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's uh, like, it, it's a pretty, it, it's not complicated at all. So I think that, um, yeah, the, the, we, we didn't release one with the paper, but the plan is to um, to release one so that people can play around with this algorithm. Um, I'll also, uh, just, just so you know, um, because my time is up in this room, I have time after this so I can stay and answer these questions. I'm just gonna move to um, another area, like a common area. So um, yeah, give me a minute and uh, I'll just go on mute and move to the common area. Okay, okay. thank you. Uh, so uh, guys, in between, uh, we have time to put more questions if you have uh, any more. Uh, again, I remind you, if you can, please donate. It means a lot of us. Uh, any sum, anything, it's really, really important to support Ukraine. Um, also, um, in, bet in between, I uh, can tell you about what's going on next with AI for Ukraine. So next week, we will have our, uh, another speaker coming to us. Uh, it will be Martin Schmidt, uh, CEO and co-founder of Equilibri Technology. And he will share his knowledge on player of games. It's a general purpose algorithm that unifies previous approaches, combining Guide, uh, guided search, self-played learning, and game theoretic reasoning. Uh, so this is the first um, algorithm to achieve strong empirical performance in large, perfect, and imperfect information games. So stay tuned. Uh, register for the next session next week. We will be happy to see you also there. Um, again, um, if you have more questions, please write them down, we are happy to answer them, all of them. And I see that Misha is starting to join us. Uh, so, yeah. And we'll start with question then, if you're ready. Uh, yes, I'm ready. Okay, uh, I'll read them, I'll just allow it so we have a little bit of conversation. So the first uh, question goes from Alina Perlova. She asked, does attention mechanism universally perform well for different languages or other languages that are harder to model in this way? Um, yeah, it's a great question. Uh, so one way to think about the attention mechanism is it is like a universal neural computer and it will basically do as well as you know the data that you give it. So languages that have a lot of data are really well represented, like English, for example, um, or Chinese, uh, or Mandarin. Um, whereas there are languages, you know, there's, for example, languages that don't, that some rare ones that are just oral, that don't really have a written record, and it will do much for for, for those. Um, so generally, if you can supply enough data, um, it will do quite well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Uh, next goes from Vitaly Bonder. He asked, um, GPT-like training got a useful background uh, signal by calculating loss on each token. On the other hand, uh, reinforcement learning obviously struggles because of weak loss signal. Are there interesting words that improve the amount of signal for RL? Um, yeah, that's also a really good question. Um, so I guess um, it depends on, uh, which environment you're using like for this to be true. So weak loss signal is usually for reinforcement learning with sparse rewards if you're doing queue learning. So if you have an online agent that has sparse rewards, it's doing queue learning, and so the loss signal is really weak. If you're able to, to convert RL into a sequential prediction problem like we've been discussing, um, then the loss signal is just strong because it's just predicting actions and you know reward tokens, it doesn't really, you know, it's, it's not really doing queue learning. But, you know, if you want to do something like you know algorithm distillation and you need good source data, so if you have a sparse reward signal and you can't generate like a single pass RL agent that will solve it, then you're kind of out of luck. So there are 
a number of exploration agents, like single task powerful exploration agents that have been um, researched recently. There's one called, um, from DeepMind called Agent 57, um, and it has a recent follow-up work called Mean, which kind of showed that if you, you can provide these exploration bonuses um, that a lot of other works have also studied. For example, a bonus for the agent discovering something new, like it, it's done something for the first time, so that's like an intrinsic reward. So with these intrinsic rewards, you can kind of get agents to explore and solve hard tasks, but I would say it's still an open research question. So um, it's, yeah, there, there isn't like a definitive answer for what to do when the loss signal is weak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Um, again, uh, we have another question from uh, Vahdan. Uh, can you share your opinion on existing and possible application of reinforcement learning in general and decision transformers in particular um, to problems of automated theorem providing and or theorem generating? Yeah, so um, I think that's been a pretty like a an open question for RL, like how do you translate, you know, these advances from um, video games? And, and let me know, is there, is there a lot of background signal coming from me? Because I can move. A bit, a bit. Okay, let me try to move to just like, uh, yeah, it's a common area, sorry. Yeah, yeah no worries, yeah. Um, so we're just waiting for uh, Misha to join from another room. Meanwhile, again, if you have more questions, just write them. We are happy to answer. And there's really a lot of good questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's good that uh, we can sh uh, show Misha that uh, we are interacting a lot and his work and his time um, is uh, really appreciated with our community. Okay, let's let's try this. I just moved, you know, like uh, 10 meters over. So hopefully it's okay. Um, yeah, so I think that there's been um, two lines of work that uh, generally been using, you know, taking RL and applying it to um, to practical use cases. So one is sometimes these narrow agents um, can be really good. So there's some work on like um, stabilizing fusion reactors that DeepMind released. Um, there's yeah, kind of alpha code um, which you uses like the RL like search like mechanism to do specific coding challenges. So sometimes when you're kind of, when you have enough data for your narrow problem, RL can be good, but that's, I think probably we'll see much more um, utility from generalist RL agents. And the first, the ones that I think are probably the most practical right now, and could, it, maybe this is uh, somewhat surprising is uh, large language models. So large language models, um, you know, if you go into the GPT-3 API, um, I actually, I, I believe, um, and I'm not sure if this is, uh, uh, this is kind of my belief, so I, I, I don't know if, uh, you know, that's what's actually happening, but through OpenAI's papers you, and, and Deep DeepMind and some others, you can kind of see that language models um, that are aligned with human feedback, so language models that are kind of aligned to do what humans want them to do, are much more powerful and useful than language models that were just pre-trained on the internet. And the way you align these language models is with reinforcement learning. So you have humans kind of generate ratings for a language model's outputs. You learn a reward function, and then you kind of fine tune the language model um, against its human prefer preferred reward function. And it ends up generating better summarization, better code completion. It just does all these tasks a lot better. So probably the language models that if you played with them, um, you know, through the API, the ones you're playing with are probably um, fine-tuned with reinforcement learning. Um, yeah, and, and I think this is kind of related to like this automated theorem proving. Um, like probably where you'll see the first breakthroughs are taking a pre-trained language model and then aligning it somehow with the reward signal for those tasks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good application in conversational AIs like chatbot answering like uh, different. Um, okay, yeah, then we go to, yeah, uh, thanks. Next question again from Vitaly. Uh, what reward is used in history tokens during inference? Uh, in your can transformance uh, 
reinforcement learning in context? Um, so in our case, we these tasks were all sparse reward. So it was kind of a plus. It, it was I didn't describe the environments because of kind of time constraints, but basically they were environments where the agent has to navigate somewhere and like find kind of a um, find a location in the environment and it gets a plus one reward. The environments are structured in an interesting way where the agent, um, basically the agent doesn't see where it needs to go initially. It only once it arrives to the right place, like a trap door like releases. So it can kind of see it only once it's done correctly. So these environments are kind of set up in a way where you can't ever do them zero shot. You always have to explore in order to solve any task in these environments. So it's just a plus one or zero reward. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And uh, next from Bohdan uh, Patechuk. How about online learning by using external resources like Wikipedia? Uh, can we transfer this approach into real? Yeah. So I think this is again why like transformers are so interesting because you can put whatever you want in the context. So you can imagine, you know, if you ask an agent to well, like answer a question and also cite where where it got that answer, you know, gives to give evidence so that you kind of know it's not lying. Um, you can imagine it kind of crawling, you know, uh, the internet and conditioning on some information that it finds on there to, to inform its answer. So I think that's a de definitely like an active line of research. Um, it's shown to improve language models. There's a language model from DeepMind called Retro that when you condition it on when it's allowed to interact with a giant database, it can kind of find the most relevant pieces of information from that database, put it in its context and make a better prediction. And as the field of RL gets closer, you know, to these fields of language, like large language models, um, I would imagine very similar things to emerge. Thanks. And uh, next one from uh, Alina Prilova. Uh, what do you think about GitHub Copilot? Uh, do you think it violates license agreement uh, because it can't tell you from where the code uh, comes, therefore can't cite the source? Do you see similar problems in other areas with language models? Um, yeah, it's kind of a, a, a good and uh, contentious question. Um, uh, so I guess, well, I'll, uh, my disclaimer is that uh, kind of I'm a scientist and uh, I don't deal as much with like the kind of more legal licensing things. But what I will say, I mean, from playing around with GitHub Copilot, it's pretty amazing, um, even though it's not like, so it suffers from this reliability thing I was talking about earlier and that it can't improve itself, but it's deployed in a way where that's okay because, you know, maybe 50% of the time what it outputs is not useful. So you'll just delete it, but then 50% of the time it saves you time. So it's kind of, um, like it's a use case that's this kind of failure mode is okay. Whereas autonomous vehicles, for example, is one where it's definitely not okay. Um, and in terms of like license agreements, um, I guess I would say this, this field is quite early um, where a lot of, um, yeah, there are a lot of kinks that are to be ironed out and you have two options. You can either, you know, not deploy the model and try to kind of solve them all in advance, which is definitely one way to do it. Um, or the other one is that you can kind of deploy it and then learn how humans use it and try to make it better. Um, I think it's kind of, it's hard to make things better without the human feedback. So I suspect these sorts of things will start becoming um, much more important kind of parts of the product where they, um, I think that they're already doing this where they're making sure that um, you know, it doesn't just copy someone's code exactly. Um, so kind of have regularizers against that. And there is active work in terms of the previous question, how to cite prior work if it is there. So yeah, there are definitely problems, I would say, with kind of large language models um, and VLMs. Like, you know, it's the same question. Of if you kind of make something in the style of another artist, but they don't get anything, then that might be an issue. Um, but yeah, I guess it's kind of the technology in this case precedes the kind of regulation. And I, my suspicion is that the convergence point will be is that this stuff just starts to get regulated more. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, 
Again, next one, uh, do you think complex role needs some brand new uh, CS or mass ideas to get significant improvement, uh, improvements? Or is there still a lot of possibilities inside uh, in topic ideas which need to be developed? Um, yeah, I guess probably, pro maybe, you know, um, I guess CS and math, like I guess if we think about them in terms of like, yeah, machine learning breakthroughs. Um, you can either have breakthroughs, you know, within deep learning or outside of deep learning. Like, do we need something outside of deep learning? Um, I think we can actually get quite far with just deep learning, even though, even though there are some fundamental drawbacks to deep learning itself. I'd say the main bottleneck for in-context RL or in-context learning in general is limited sequence length. So uh, transformers scale really poorly with the sequence size. And there's a lot of work on um, getting architectures that accommodate longer sequences. So if you can improve you know, the efficiency of a sequence model, not necessarily even a transformer, um, and have it accommodate really long sequence length and have it kind of attend to things really well or, or be able to capture information from the sequence lengths, um, that's probably gonna be a breakthrough that's needed for the kind of next generation of models. Mm -hmm. uh, next uh, question also from Badam. Uh, do, do you see possibility of applying causality into transformance and context learning? If so, uh, what are your insights about that? Um, yeah, I must say I, I don't have, um, I think, much insight in terms of um, formal causality. Uh, I, something, it might be important, um, but I guess one of the lessons from like deep learning that we're seeing in transformers is that things that we thought needed kind of a lot of you know new formal breakthroughs, um, a lot of them have kind of emerged implicitly um, without like ever having kind of optimized for them explicitly. Um, I don't know if that's going to be true. Like maybe maybe you do need to infuse um, causality somehow in a, in a formal way. Um, but yeah, I, I think that on this one, yeah, on this one, I don't think I have a very, um, you know, nuanced or insightful answer. Uh, next question from Hilo. Can you point where and how to start learning or using neural? Uh, yes, uh, I actually, so I guess my personal story is that I, I've only been in the field of machine learning, I guess, the last, or research in the last three years. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I did my, I studied in physics and I kind of transitioned through like a, I had like a self-study set, uh, you know, half year or something. And there's this great resource um, by OpenAI called Spinning Up um, that I would suggest. So maybe I can put it in the comments. Oh, maybe I can't put it in the comments. But, it's, if you Google spinning up OpenAI, it's like a really nice tutorial in RL with code that I think is probably the best thing out there. Um, then the other thing I would suggest is uh, there are courses from on uh, Berkeley's web YouTube channel that are just open um, by Sergey Levine and Peter Abiel that are really good. And then uh, DeepMind also has some courses uh, by David Silver um, and others that, that are good. So I think that combination of spinning up, which is gonna give you um, everything in text and you'll have access to code um, and then having the more the video lectures alongside that is going to be really helpful. Uh, yes, Misha, can you, uh, if you have time after, can you share with uh, our audience this list that you mentioned just like, I don't know, um, somewhere sent to us to organize it so we can share oh. later? Yeah, if let, it's me, okay with you. let me just do that right now. Um, spinning up. Yeah, here I have I have the link, so I'll just put it in the chat between us, and you can share it with um, the group. There it is, um, and I will have to go um, in three minutes, um, so I hope that's all right. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, we will speed um, do it very quick. So next one, it's more about uh, even not a question. Misha, thank you so much. It's from Alisa uh, for the session. It was super cool and useful. Besides, <laughs> you stole the heart of all the Ukrainian girls in EA. <laughs> so, uh, 
uh, yeah, this is a good piece of feedback too. Yeah, and next um, one is like. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, from Bogdan uh, Podechuk, Misha, thank you a lot for your speech. Uh, be careful when coming to Ukraine. Our beautiful girls can be a travel for you. And um, again, from Bogdan, thank you a lot for the talk and for all the answers. Uh, yeah, I think those three comments um, can also highlight uh, that how much we appreciate you taking time with us today, supporting Ukraine, sharing your um, latest work. Uh, thank you again. It was a, a really a great pleasure. Uh, we hope to see you in Ukraine on our talks and much, much more. Uh, we wish you like more achievements at your work, to see more papers. Uh, and thank you again for joining us. Um, yeah, uh, thank you for having me. It was, um, yeah, it was really uh, my, my pleasure. And thank you for all the questions. Um, yeah, I, uh, I'm happy to, to support the cause and uh, yeah, we'll also try to loop in maybe some of my colleagues to, to participate. Thanks. All right. Have a great day. Bye, bro. Uh, thank you guys for joining today us. Uh, I will ask you uh, again to do one small poll so we have the feedback for us uh, so we can improve um, our next uh, lectures. Just tell us how to do like the session today so we can improve, find more uh, such an interesting uh, speakers in future sessions. So we can see that a lot of liked uh, like it a lot. Thank you again so much. Uh, you will have the recordings. Also, we'll send you the link from Misha about the learning where you can start with Earl. Um, keep safe, uh, keep donating. Uh, we are happy that you are joining uh, uh, with uh, all our next session and before. Um, and again, thank you. See you next time.